Hello and welcome to Flipping the Table's first episode of season five. We are pleased to focus 2023 on how we can scale up many critical solutions to our food and farming challenges. Our future depends on it. In this episode, Michael speaks with the founder of Los Angeles-based Food Forward, perhaps the nation's most successful food recovery program. The climate crisis and the human right to healthy food requires we end food waste. Rick Namayas shows the way on a giant scale. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to episode one of Flipping the Table's fifth season. I'm very pleased to be continuing this podcast. It's like going to school for me. All my guests are great teachers who are making changes on the ground that are creating a more just, healthy, and resilient food system. In season four, we focused on the big challenges and some activities underway to address them. In this fifth season, the theme will be scale. We'll try to answer the question, how do we scale up the solutions that are proven to work but are in need of acceleration or expansion in order to fix food and farming? We do this because the times call for massive scaling and acceleration of change. So, we begin this season with Rick Namias, the founder and executive director of Food Forward which I believe is the largest and most impressive food recovery program in the nation. I invite anyone to prove me wrong about that because I'm always open to new information. But as you will hear, Rick and his team practice food recovery on a grand scale, reaching 12 California counties, six states, and 150,000 people per day. They have provided way over a billion servings of food since they started. Rick had a big idea and he's built the team to make it happen. And before founding Food Forward in 2011, he was an award-winning photographer and writer who focused on the faces and stories of marginalized communities. His formal training as a cook along with his exploration of California's agricultural workforce, gave him a deep appreciation of and involvement in both the gourmet cooking and food justice worlds. These varied interests, along with his conviction that access to healthy, fresh, nutritious food is a human right, culminated in his full commitment to Food Forward in 2011. He has kept the growth and innovation going ever since, and today we'll explore how he did it. So let's begin. Rick, great to see you. Welcome uh, to Flipping the Table. Really looking forward to our conversation. I really appreciate uh, you having me, Michael. It's uh, been great watching the organization and especially the podcast grow since you've uh, initiated it and really yeah, honored to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, You've been up to a lot of interesting things in the years that uh, I, I've watched what you've been doing. As I said in the intro, we met long ago when you were in a different world. So I want to start this podcast with you really just describing your pathway to Food Forward. Sure. Well, my last career was in photography. I was a photo documentarian and uh, very much focusing on the story of marginalized communities which took me into the the first major project that I initiated was on migrant farm workers in California. And it gave me a deep, deep appreciation, which I continue to have as of today, of the skilled labor and the ongoing struggles that farm labor has in our state and beyond. And trying to use the migrant project as a bridge to kind of speak about the us and them equation And basically that became a traveling exhibition and a book and a teaching tool and opened my eyes to how photography can be used as an art and education vehicle for many subjects that are really difficult to talk about. I took on religion on the margins of California with something called Golden States of Grace. And uh, my last big project as an independent photographer was around one of the last Catskill bungalow colonies for Holocaust survivors which was a really enlightening and, and moving project for me. Okay. Um, and in interimly, I did a lot of client work, uh, much of it around sustainable ag, a little bit for Roots of Change, but really, again, trying to help people understand this massive engine 
that feeds us every day and feeds much of the country. And ironically, there was this interesting kind of lull, as many people found in 08 and 09, when our economy started to tank, if we can remember that recession, the Great Recession. And I was starting to see lines begin to form at food pantries in my area. And I live in the suburban Los Angeles area, which is studded with kind of um, older fruit trees that have kind of been planted with an American dream, a concept of having, you know, that fruit tree in your backyard, yet people don't realize 10, 20, 30 years into the life of any tree, you can start seeing hundreds of pounds of fruit. Much of this went wasted, you know, fell to squirrels or rats or what have you. And I kind of got this idea that I wanted to connect. I wanted after the 08 election, which I saw a candidate I volunteered for get into the White House and a proposition that affected my personal marriage completely flame out. I really felt the sense of needing to do something locally and immediate Mm -hmm. that would affect people. And I would have a real face to face connection. It wasn't just about phone banking or canvassing. And the idea was to collect backyard fruit and get it to places of need. Very simple concept, sharing abundance. Again, taking it from a place of of abundance and getting it to a place that that did not have it. And to my surprise, in a really positive way, our first food pantry um, embraced the donation with open arms, directed me to the um, Bill Emerson Act, uh, which basically encouraged the donation of food to any food bank or food pantry without fear of retribution should someone get sick from it. That was kind of the gold key, you know, as far as, okay, we're not going to get sued if anyone got sick from this. It opened the doors for what became Food Forward, which has grown into, I'm really proud and humbled to say, the largest volunteer-powered and urban-based produce recovery organization in the Western U.S. We now have continued with the backyard harvesting, We added a farmer's market component to it. And then I think as we'll talk about this wholesale component, which was the big gorilla that dropped into place about eight years ago, nine years ago. And uh, this year, it looks like Food Forward is going to be responsible for recovering and donating just about 70 million pounds of fresh produce that would otherwise go to waste. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, the scale of your outreach. So I I want you to describe that. It seems to me you're more than food recovery, but uh, I just want to hear, you know, kind of how you describe it when you're giving the elevator pitch to a funder or someone who who you're bringing on as an ally or or one of your your volunteers. I'm really interested in in your scale of volunteers, the support you've built and the networks for for moving food. So if you could just give us the story of, of that, it would be very interesting. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, I'm glad you, you brought up that it is more than food recovery because that was the beginning. There's the two sided coin of food waste and hunger, which to me creates this very shameful equation in, in our area. More hungry people in Los Angeles County than any other county in America and estimates of food waste of upwards of 40% of what's produced with more produce coming through the Los Angeles gateway than any other city in the country. So what's wrong with that picture, right? A lot. And we're talking about systems change, we're talking about food waste, but we're also, Michael, diving into the equation of health equity, which the Band-Aid was ripped off of two years ago, plus when the pandemic really hit. And we knew what we were doing was the right way to go, as in a plant-based diet for folks who are food insecure, But it really took, I'll honestly say, until this fall, when I was at the White House Conference on Food and Nutrition, Hunger and Nutrition, excuse me, where I really finally heard the buy-in from all the stakeholders saying, healthy food, fresh produce is where it's at for people. We've been doing it for 14 years, but to know that that has been put on the, the agenda as a priority felt great. We look at this is a food justice organization. We also look at food access as a human right and really try to create the lowest barriers for receiving our produce as humanly possible. The organization is very much a B2B. That was purposefully architected by myself when I started out. I did a lot of research and I found that there were at the time about, I don't know, 1,300 
food agencies passing out food from the food bank or some other entity. What there wasn't was a direct pipeline from growers, from homeowners, from any source into the food security community. They were going to the food bank. They were getting maybe 20, 20% of their overall allotment was produce. But the food bank is indeed a huge beast and an essential beast in our, in our ecosystem. But they are focusing on kind of the whole diet. We really went for what felt very important, which was solely produce. We also went as the supplier route. We did not need to really use all of our energy and all of our muscle to feed one agency in one location. We felt if there was this kind of rippling out wheel and spoke scenario, we would be serving the community best and we'd be able to move more produce. You know, food pantries have a lot of responsibility. They have a lot of compliance. They have a lot of metrics they have to keep track of. I mean, not that we don't keep metrics, but I felt like there would be a lot more bang for the buck. And as you know, using the word scale, there was a lot more opportunity to grow if the B2B equation panned out. And that's indeed what we did. And that's what we do. Mm-hmm. We don't hold individual distributions, but we are now able to get food to the food bank and many, many food banks that we serve. But we also are able to, through a, a, a new addition to our warehouse, that, that came up during COVID is create, we created something called the Sprout, which is purposely directed to small mixed loads of a few cases of fresh produce to that small pantry or that small school giveaway. So one of the kind of, I guess, secrets of Food Forward, not so, not so much a secret, but one of our wins has been both the diversification of produce sources, again, everything from backyards to massive growers like Driscoll, diversification of agencies from LGBT seniors who are low income to after-school programs to farm workers and, and beyond to a diversification of the types of produce. On an average year, we're giving away between three and 400 types of fruits and vegetables, where in the first year it was mostly oranges, grapefruits, and pomegranates. That's really led to a really robust interaction with many different stakeholders. Mm-hmm. So just to clarify for people, the B2B means that really the uh, last mile is taken care of by your sister agencies, your collaborators. Our, yeah. our agency partners, which are all nonprofits, they could be as big as the YMCA and have 15 you know, outlets that they distribute our produce through, which is always super efficient for us because we get a truckload to them rather than a few boxes and they take it that last mile and they do, they do that work. That's mm-hmm. very specialized work. We don't want to question anyone's ability to do it or how they do it. We do ask to see it before we engage. And there's a pretty rigorous onboarding process for new agencies. But the idea has been to build partnerships. Mm-hmm. And I think for those of the folks that are in your audience listening, you know, if there's one thing people ask me a lot about, about what's kind of the secret of scale and what's the secret of longevity, it's building and recognizing and maintaining high level, high functioning partnerships. Just because we're in nonprofit, just because we're in the hunger space, doesn't mean that you can just throw your food willy nilly to anybody that says, hey, I need some. There are some super high capacity partners, several who were hatched in the last three years out of necessity, but some who are decades old. And I really feel like you have to meet partners where they're at once you've vetted them, but there's nothing wrong with having accountability. You've got to have that accountability. You know, of the three programs we run, Backyard Harvest, Farmer's Market, and Wholesale, if I jump to the Farmer's Market program, which is now at about 15 markets, it was at 25 during pre-pandemic times. And and describe what it is that you do with the Farmer's Market so people get it. So the Farmer's Market program is our, our middle child, if you will. And as a middle child myself, I have a lot of affinity for it. (laughs) <laughs> it was one that w- we got very lucky. Uh, we were in touch with Laura Avery, who at the time was the uh, manager, longtime champion of farmers markets here in Santa Monica. And there was this wonderful woman who was a, a mom and an attorney and a food kind of warrior. 
And she hated to find out that much of what is not sold at the end of a market session is dumped because it costs too much in fuel to drive it back to the farm only to compost it. When we heard about this and she kind of got in touch and said, hey, I know you're doing these backyard harvests. What if we got volunteers and we started a farmer's market recovery program? We got a, a small grant to do a pilot and it blew the doors off. We were at uh, Santa Monica, Studio City and Hollywood, the three biggest markets in Los Angeles. And within a matter of months, we dialed in these really cool ecosystems. We got volunteers from the neighborhood. The market was there temporarily at each of those locations for half a day. And the agencies that would then receive that produce were all with any, anywhere from a half block to maybe five miles. So the farmer's market recovery program really created these beautiful mini ecosystems that allowed us to engage a very localized footprint but also the farmer's market audience, which we hope to engage even more deeply next year, really got a full snapshot of, of this kind of beautiful virtu uh, virtuous circle. And farmers got to see their produce go to people instead of the trash. And they receive annually an accounting for tax purposes of the produce they've donated. So there's a win to them as well on that front you know, from the thousands of farmers you've worked with, the last thing they want to see is a single carrot that they've nurtured get thrown in the trash unnecessarily. So we're a connector there. One of my dreams is that we become part of enough municipal groups that when a new farmer's market is created, a food recovery component becomes lock, stock, and barrel part of that initiation. But the food waste element is not an afterthought that you tack on it's something that is that is just germane to the conversation when you start. So, so I have a question. I have a question. Uh, how many farmers markets are you dealing with now? We're at 15. We were at 25. And I think we'll probably go back to 22 and then look at some new ones. Mm -hmm. um, the, the challenge we've had is there's just been a, a shakeout in markets over the pandemic where yeah. some of those that might have had, we usually have a threshold of about 15 produce donors. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the cost benefit of weekly coordination makes sense. Less than that, you'd see four or five boxes. And it's not that that doesn't matter, but we couldn't, we couldn't substantiate the staff involvement for that. But the entire farmer's market program, like Backyard Harvest, is fully volunteer-led. Right. So that requires a fair amount of coordination the big one, the wholesale program, which we'll talk about, is staff-led, and that's mostly from a safety standpoint and from the hours in which the uh, wholesale recovery is done. Mm -hmm. So before we get to that, I just want you to quickly talk about the backyard because, you know, as you know, I, I, I've been on the board of Farm to Pantry up in Northern California here, and that's, that is primarily volunteer-led harvesting at farms and, and backyards, and it is a lot to keep those going in a, a functional way. It's a lot to manage volunteers, to find volunteers, to keep volunteers. So I'm very curious about how you've done it at such scale. It's been a road and I, you know, I'm really excited to say right now, um, you know, when this is broadcast, we'll be through it, but we're just, ra we're in the midst of our end of year campaign. And, and I get a daily kind of tally of donations that come in and I'm seeing donations, even small ones coming from people who donated, I'm sorry, who, who volunteered with us 10 years ago. Wow. And stop for health reasons, but now they've become donors because they feel so connected to the mission. And to me, that's really what it's about is from that first harvest, empowering an individual to see their connection and how their hands and their heart are part of the cycle that you can roll back gleaning to biblical times mm -hmm. and see the same opportunities back then. And in some cases, we work with faith-based communities, but mostly we're dealing with folks who really care about being part of a community effort, the environment, sustainability, and being a change agent within that. That was really how I saw my involvement in it. And that's how I nurtured additional volunteers. You know, you can give them awards, you can give them titles, but it's really, we find, and we have, I will tell you, we have volunteers who are doing two and three harvests a week. Wow. They're crazy. They go up and down the coast all the way up into deep Ventura County where we have an office and 
and many gleams at kind of gentle gentlemen and gentlewomen farmers up in the Ojai Valley and whatnot. There's a sense of just peacefulness. You take your your phone and you put it away. You get off the internet, and for two or three hours, there you are with nature. And again, in a way that is benefiting many stakeholders, including yourself, but that at the end of the day, you have several hundred pounds of produce that would have gone to waste without you. Mm -hmm. So there's a real simplicity, Michael, that never gets old for me around hands on fruit, fruit in the box, box to people, and never drifting from that mission, no matter what the program we have, I think has really been key to food forward success. Mm -hmm. is mission drift is so seductive. There's so many things when you start being successful that people want you to do Mm -hmm. or want to fund you to do, and you can start chasing the funding and drift off into another area. I'm I'm really grateful we haven't done that out of discipline. Part of it's been myself, the staff, uh, the board. Mm -hmm. And I I don't see that happening. There was a little blip in uh, COVID when we put our hands on those USDA boxes and we were able to move Uh, a couple of million of them over the course of that time. And that was important. It was a triage situation. It was all hands on deck, right? But the moment that kind of stopped, we went completely back to produce and we're very happy to do so. And just staying staying on mission is really what it's about. So I I just want to go one one more question regarding that program, that first program, that original program. How many volunteers are you engaged with at any given time? So pre-pandemic, we were seeing about 5,000 unique volunteers a year. What we've started to do, and I'm really happy to say is, you know, of the silver linings the pandemic gave us, the biggest aha moment with volunteerism was that those volunteers prior to the pandemic who would just show up for a harvest and then go away, we actually were able to engage with them deeply to set up the harvest to harvest the fruit and then to drop it. So they became these kind of one-stop shops for the whole process to the point where we're now closing out the year with, I think, over 2,200 harvest events for 2022. That means that could have been one person at one single tree in a residence, or that could be 40 volunteers who came out to the Huntington Gardens where we have a decades long relationship and we're harvesting their fruit trees. We've come to count them by events rather than volunteers because to me, the success that one piece of person brings can be just as important as having a team of 40 people out there. We hope you're enjoying the conversation. If you are, please rate our podcast and offer a review. Your voice will help us grow our listener base which helps us sustain the funding to share these conversations with the people and organizations shaping a more just and regenerative future. A future in which the food and farm businesses are helping to solve the largest challenges of our time. So let's move now to the wholesale, the big kahuna that's allowed you, according to your website, you're now in six states and 12 counties where yes. you're delivering food. That's remarkable. I want you to talk about that, how you got there, but I think this is probably the key. Well, the 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 key is now for our sustainability, we just, you know, we've just codified a strategic plan that gives oxygen and resources to each of these three programs for the next few years, which I'm happy to say, because they're all really important. They're all unique, and I think they're all complementary. The wholesale, without a doubt, is is eclipses the other two in volume. And it kind of came out by accident. As the farmer's market and the backyard harvest programs proved out super successful, they brought up our our web searches, uh, web optimization to a level where a Florida company, let's say, looking to deal with a food recovery organization of tropical fruit, they would find food forward and they would call us not knowing that we had no wholesale ability for pallets or truckloads. We got a couple of those. And those of us in leadership started looking at each other and saying, well, wait a minute here. We have the network. We may not have the trucks or the warehouse or whatever, but we have the network. And what I've always said to people who are interested in getting their feet wet and gleaning is you need three things. You need the supply, you need the demand, and you need leadership. Everything else 
is easy. And we had all that stuff. So what we did is, again, we got a pilot grant. I'm a big, big proponent of doing pilots. And we found an unusually talented and connected individual uh, to, to lead the effort. Our goal for the first year was 300,000 pounds of wholesale recovery. And that was palletized cases of almost, I don't know, 12, 1500 pounds at a go per, per pallet and getting 300,000 pounds of that out into our network. Instead of 300,000 pounds, we saw 4.1 million pounds. Wow. In so year that, one. There was pent up demand. Um, yes. So just let people know what you mean by wholesale. So who who's sure. engaged? Well, when we started this, it was exclusively at the LA Produce Terminal downtown, which is the clearinghouse for every large wholesale distributor, in most of the country. There's a, there's a New York market in Hunts Point. LA's terminal is really representative of the Western US. And any major player has a footprint there and usually a warehouse within a few miles. We found- Those could be farms and they could be just brokers. They could be anyone who's getting- Diamond houses. Yeah. It was rarely farmers directly at that point. It's mm-hmm. since grown into farmers, but it could be all to, also multinationals like- uh, you know, like a Driscoll or a Dole or Chiquita. You know, we also, again, have a footprint in Ventura County by Port Wainimi, which is the largest receiver of tropical fruit, which a lot of people don't realize. So that got activated as well. There's been a lot of fits and starts with the LA port. and We do have some relationships there, but it's not been as prolific as we, we would think. But what happens is we either solicit or we are solicited by any number of produce distributors that have viable produce at scale and want to donate it. That's really that simple. They also will receive a tax donation for what they're giving us. And we will guarantee that that produce will be distributed to one of 350 agencies that we work with. Again, keeping it really, really simple. You know, there is an 80% viability limit that we speak of, I'd say most of the produce we get is the 100% mark. What does that mean? 80% viability? 80% is edible. You know, if there's a few rotten apples in there, we can deal with it. If you're trying to send us 50% rotten and 50% viable, we we won't take it. The cost of sorting that and disposing of it, it's, it's just not worth it. And also there is a day or two between the donation and it receive it, it reaching its end point where even more of that's going to degrade. So we don't want to be giving out anything that we ourselves will not eat. Mm -hmm. Um, So we've gotten it down into the very minute single digits of of produce that gets discarded or composted. You know, we've seen, I think, three or four truckloads a day of blueberries recently. We're about to hit Roma tomato season, which starts in Mexico. And I know because this happens every year is come mid to late January we will start seeing floods of trucks of Roma tomatoes that are perfectly edible, but because there is such a bumper crop, the price drops and driving them from San Diego border up to Los Angeles is a money losing proposition. So they're gonna make more money as a donation than they would if they brought it to market and then find there are even more tomatoes that that don't sell. So what what we've been doing with the help of a produce ambassador this year, someone in the industry with 20, 30 years of experience, we went to the uh, International Fresh Produce Association uh, convention in Orlando and really started to learn how to speak produce a little bit more professionally from the for-profit side. We do offer a really strong value proposition and we had to learn how to actually verbalize that. And so that's been something we've been working on now that we're at scale. But um, what we have found is there is definitely attraction for large um, wholesale farmers, repackagers, people that do private label work to keep us on speed dial. We're super responsive. And and most importantly, they're seeing their product get to people and again, not the trash. Mm -hmm. And with a law that has recently started to get some teeth, SB 1383, if they're operating in the confines of California, they will soon be mandated or face heavy fines to actually find food recovery orgs. We're really the only game in town that can handle 
large scale multi truck monocrops. Like we can take five trucks of Brussels sprouts and find a home for them. That's even something the LA Food Bank can't do because it's not their specialty. And our whole team has migrated from the docks and the offices of for profit produce. So with them, they brought best practices, they brought relationships, and really wanting to work for a mission-based organization. So that's been really exciting and it's taught me a great deal. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating thing. I'm going to try and feed back to you some of the things that I'm hearing that maybe we can go deeper into. One is you've talked so much about the network and the relationships, the ecosystems. Those are the three ways you've described it. You need this ecosystem of, of, of human capital, uh, of, of, of people who have knowledge and relationships to be at the center of this thing so that you can actually figure out how to do it efficiently and how to uh, maximize your reach. But then also you need to be in a place where there are sources. I mean, you live in Los Angeles, which is close to Ventura. And as we all, as many of us will know, LA was what at one point, LA County is at one point the most productive agricultural county in the United States. So there are remnants of that that you're sourcing from in your backyards. And then you're living on the edge of, of San Diego County, the Inland Empire, places where there are small peri-urban farms that are coming to the market. So you're in a beautiful place. And then you also have access to lots of volunteers, people yes. who live there. I mean, it's a big population, right, uh, in the region. And, and do you have any sense of how far away some of your volunteers come from? Uh, that's actually a great question. I do see engagement. I mean, we, we've we had volunteers more that, that are in LA and then jettison off to places like India that stay in touch with us and try and start gleaning opportunities there. We've had people, we have one amazing volunteer, her name's Rosanna. This is a woman who is solely reliant and engaged with public transportation. And she lives in South Los Angeles and she will take the bus to Ventura to lead a harvest. Extraordinary individual. What are and you like a vo- volunteer of the year last year. And this, this is a woman who's probably been with us eight or 10 years at least, and who epitomizes that commitment to, to being a change maker in the system and brings just a, a grace and humility that's, that's really off the charts. You know, I was really taken with the conversation you had recently with Maureen McGuire about Ventura. Uh-huh. And I love her her take on Ventura. We've always found it this really interesting enigma, you know, as a cousin kissing cousin county. And from the first harvest we had there, I was like, this is a different ball of wax from L.A. You somehow cross that county line and just the way people approach life. I, I love it. We have several employees that live up there and there's there's a mellower take on things. It's a more connected, smaller town feel. And my my take as the leader of the organization was, besides the non-negotiables of we never sell the produce and it's always going to a 501c3, let Ventura do what they do best and let them figure out how a glean works best in Ventura County. Mm-hmm. And, and I just think we're at this really interesting point where you are seeing a lot of the small farms disappear, but those that are remaining are real stalwarts, you know. You see uh, Phil McGrath passing his land on to a next generation, and you just see that there is a uh, an allegiance to to agriculture still. Which even when you and I collaborated almost twenty years ago, mm-hmm. there was still a lot of question of what is the what is agriculture in California going to look like in the future. Mm-hmm. It's still amazing, you know. You've got people like Alex Weiser who's still farming up in Tehachapi, and all these people that are multi-generational committed to it. And that's why I feel like an organization like Food Forward hopefully has the ability to, to go into a new generation. Mm-hmm. We are we are in, a, in an area, a county, Los Angeles, that has over 1 million residential fruit trees. We get to a tiny, yeah, we get to a tiny fraction of that. That's a stat from the California Ag Department. Wow. And when I think about it, it always motivates me to do more and hopefully do it smarter. But then you also look at a a city of Los Angeles that I think has 200 plus farmers markets weekly. So there is a, a huge demand for this, you know, a, a constant interchange of agriculture in our lives. 
The question is finding the stakeholders, the volunteers, the board members, the donors that really see this as a unique place in the country and wanting to preserve it. And I'm, I'm really pleased to say that many of our donors of the foundations that support us, the individuals have been around for seven, eight, 10 years now with us. And I think continue to see the place that we fill that's really unique and that there's a, a multiple levels of wins. I mean, it's not just getting fresh produce to an agency, but by getting that free produce to that agency, you are relieving them of having to spend the money of buying it. Mm -hmm. So there is a cost savings that gets redirected back into their programmatic bottom line, whether it's recidivism or childcare or elder care, they get to spend those dollars that they could spend 60, 100, $300,000. I think the calculation this year was approximately 300 to $350,000 we give to our agencies each an in-kind support in the form of free produce. Wow. That'll only go up next year because the cost of food is going up. Yeah. But the idea that they don't have to spend the time procuring it, they don't have to spend the money on it, strengthens their organization. And that's something, again, that I, I feel is kind of a, a win that we don't always know how to express, but it's important as a piece of social capital to, to recognize it. Mm -hmm. I saw on the website that you actually have worked with some uh, tribal communities or tribal uh, entities as far yeah. away as Oklahoma. Can you describe that? Yeah. So during the pandemic, we were really tested. We were tested because food insecurity rates went through the roof and there wasn't a day that there wasn't multiple knocks on the door. Could we take on a new agency? Could we do this distribution? And I think we all saw food waste as this kind of shameful escalating story. But also, again, as I, I talk about food equity, we saw food equity ex inequities and food a a lack of access exposed deeply in urban communities of color, but also in tribal communities. Talk about being cut off and being isolated. And we were really lucky to have a donor step up and understand when we pitch to them this concept of a kind of portfolio of rural and isolated communities that needed help and they needed consistent help. And that did start with farm worker communities where I had some relationships out in Coachella, where we still are on a monthly basis, bringing a 53 footer of mixed produce. And that's going out to, I think last count was about 1500 families in the course of one day. Mm. At the same time, we started to see tribal communities, Navajo Nation, Cherokee Nation, and others, which were also having that same need. And so we worked with an organization called Vegan Outreach, and they became the intermediary and sent us trucks. And our produce, again, a 53-footer, would go all the way out to Oklahoma. Our goal next year is to do a more close-to-home analysis of gaps in service with indigenous tribes in the SoCal community, in the SoCal footprint, mm -hmm. because where it's lovely to see that produce land in Oklahoma, that's now $4,000 in transportation. Right. More importantly, our priorities at Food Forward have been and remain kind of concentric circles that, that ripple out from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I do know that there are indigenous tribes in SoCal that are in need. Yeah. And the, and they're the, also uh, farm yeah. workers, indigenous farm workers. We're working on a project, well, that Maureen and I talked about around farm workers. A lot of them are indigenous. Yes. Obviously, healthy food access is a challenge in Ventura County and farm worker communities and Coachella, all the places uh, down in San Diego. Yeah. I mean, it's everywhere. So, we, yeah, we, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. We've now got about a half dozen of those monthly distributions in that portfolio. Most of those are farm workers. Some are native. We have one that's really interesting in an area called Trona, T-R-O-N-A, near Ridgecrest, which is a town that has developed around a borax mine. It's in western uh, San Bernardino County, right by the Kern County line. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a no man's land, and the supervisors up there kind of don't really have the ability or do much help. And uh, we have an Inland Empire partner in San Bernardino that connected us to this and now they're getting monthly distributions. This is 
a community that's, you know, 20 miles from their closest grocery store. Wow. And so to know, like, when you think of rural, we often go to farm work and that's a huge population, but there are people that work in hospitality. There are people that work in mining. Right. And how are they getting healthy food? We're, we're happy to be part of the solution. We're definitely not the only solution, but when I see footage or photographs of those distributions, they are particularly rewarding because I know there is no other opportunity for the fresh produce to get there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're coming to the end here. So I'm, I, I want to wrap up thinking about, you mentioned the new law in California, uh, SB 1383, that was passed a few years ago and is, is taking effect, increasingly taking effect. And by 2025, I think it is 20% of all the food that's from restaurants and grocery stores has to be captured by law for food recovery. Or the, as you mentioned, there'll be fines. So that's going to create a lot of the organizations that are food recovery or gleaning oriented around the state are thinking about this. You mentioned it. So I'm I'm just curious about where you think you're going to go with this because it's, it's new opportunities, but it's new complexities, grocery stores, restaurants. There's a lot, I mean, where it really gets down to um, that last mile problem. So right. I'm very curious about what your thoughts in that realm are. It's going to be interesting. I think the way that California law has worked so far around food recovery has been very much a very gradual phasing in of these laws. And I understand the logic of that because they are going to require a fair amount of infrastructure investment that's not there and a change in the way business owners are thinking about waste in their own cycles. That said, we're now almost two years into this law, and I think we've had one company knock on our door to say, hey, can we partner with you? We've had letters sent out. We've done emailing. It's been a very slow start on this law, and my my thinking is because there's no real penalties right now. It's almost a, a, a toothless law, which is going to change. Um, so the I, I would say the 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 jury's still out on how it's how successful it's going to be. I will tell you with an agency like Cal Recycle in the government, we've we've been really really heartened by their consistency, by the strength of their messaging and by their um their partnership with us. We we are a grantee of theirs, but they're very forward thinking and there are so many steps ahead of most state government agencies that I I have a lot of hope that they're going to press the right levers at the right time, get the right educational campaigns out there, and hopefully make the connections. We we are really specific. Like we're not gleaning and not interested in gleaning grocery stores. There's many, many small nonprofits that get out and do their local Ralphs or Kroger's or what whatnot. We're interested in dealing with, let's say, a Ralphs or Kroger's at the distribution level when they've got pallets of baby carrots that they just can't sell because there's just too many on the market or that because there's fresher stuff coming up the road, they want to get rid of it. That's where we can step in, but we're not really interested or set up to take the the kind of the restaurant waste nor the individual grocery store waste. Are and you already in touch with those distribution centers for the big retailers? We are with some and it's it's been very slow. It's been very slow. And um a lot of them are, you know, like I believe the Ralphs and Kroger's folks have put together a very impressive MRF and composting slurry kind of thing. But our hope is that we can intervene before food gets to that level so that it's not just a composting thing. Because we know in that pyramid of where waste is most effective is going to human beings. Yeah. So we would love to intervene at that level and making um, stronger connections with those distro centers is key. We are connected with a lot of the wholesalers that sell to them. And when Ralph's refuses a load of 12 truckloads of mangoes, for whatever reason, those distributors call us. But I also think a relationship with the Ralph's Kroger's distro centers would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, good. Okay. So what, one last question for you. If I have actually two. One is real quick, why Food Forward as the as the name of the entity, which I've always enjoyed. I think it's smart, but I'm curious of what your thinking was. And then the second final one is beyond 1383, what are you thinking the future holds for the food recovery 
the emerging piece of the food justice world that food recovery is? Well, the name was pretty simple. It was a year or two after the the film and book Pay It Forward came out. And it just made so much sense. It was exactly what we're doing is we're really moving someplace again from a place of abundance into a place of need. And you're moving it forward and it's a gift. You're talking to someone who's been a longtime member of the Burning Man community and one of the principles that Burning Man operates on is gifting. And I took that to heart as I joined that community around the time Food Forward began is we are giving this food with no expectation of anything in return and moving it forward into the hands of someone who needs it in itself is a reward. Mm-hmm. And so that's really where the name stuck. It The alliteration helped. Yeah. And uh, here we are today, 14 years later. Yeah. Um, as far as what's next, what I'm really grateful for is, you know, most recently the LA Food, the LA County Food Equity Roundtable, a body on which I sit, really took and has taken food recovery as a big piece of the blueprint and strategic plan they just released. The LA Times has gotten behind it. And I think if you look at this huge amount of supply that really just needs logistical support and distribution, you can alleviate a huge amount of the need of food insecurity. And again, we're talking about a community that was documented just this season at one in four families being food insecure. That's insane. Insane. We have the calories, we have the healthy calories. This is not a supply problem. It's a distribution problem. So I would really love to see more public-private partnerships uh, where, let's say, you get a, a Google involved where you've started seeing them come in with refed. I'd love to see relationships where we could access some of those software programs to help our logistics get ahead of the curve and not just be on an, on an as needed basis, but actually think strategically three, four years down the road for what is the next food forward warehouse? Where should that fall? Who should that serve? And what are the supply chains and carbon footprint that we can mitigate by placing it in the right spot? We use professional software, but we are not software engineers and we're not, we are just not at that level of sophistication. The private sector is, we have Silicon Valley right up the road, right? Finding partners of that sort that can help with logistics and, you know, kind of pro bono guidance would be really wonderful. And I think that's, there, there is a spirit of mentoring and pri- public private partnerships in California. It'd be great to see those step forward and, and mature into something to help solve some of these problems. Yeah. I, I, I think that's really smart what you're saying. And I, and I, I actually had an opportunity a couple of months ago to interview the founder of Refed. And I, so I really, yeah, it's, I think there's a lot there that, that approach uh, the rationalization, the optimization of of the logistics seems really a wonderful thing and and a smart thing. And so, yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. And and I just want to say you you've done a, a tremendous thing, Rick. And the spirit with which you do it, the clarity, the intelligence, really wonderful to to see. And I and I'm grateful to the work that you've done. And I'm congratulate you on all the success. And and thanks for your time today for this interview. Thank you so much, Michael. It means a lot to hear that from you and, uh, you know, really appreciate the opportunity to share our story and uh, to to see you again. It's been way too long. Way too long. Yeah, I'll be in L.A. down there, so I'll see you this year, this coming year. Sounds great. Well, thank you and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you for listening and thank you to our sponsors, the Ladybug Foundation, Dan and Quincy Imhoff, Beth and Mark Wyatt, Cindy Daniel and Doug Lipton. Roots of Change is a program of the Public Health Institute.